Love at First Sting is a quintessential and at the same time one of the most triggering heavy metal albums of the 1980s. Released on the 27th of March in 1984, Love at First Sting became the ninth studio album by the legendary German band Scorpions. So to celebrate its 40th anniversary, let's take a look at the history behind and some of the strange facts around it and then discuss how this record has changed it all not only for Scorpions, but for heavy metal overall. Here you go. By the way guys, real quick, before we start, as always, please do not hesitate to comment on anything you hear or see in this video, and especially if you disagree with me, because the whole point of our Metal Pilgrim channel is, of course, to start a conversation. But alright, let's do it! Some rock and metal bands, and especially the ones formed in the early 80s, enjoyed their success almost immediately after their first release, riding the wave of hype our favorite genre has experienced back then. Yeah, it definitely wasn't the case for Scorpions, though. Formed all the way back in 1965, by the time of the release of the album, which has changed it all for them, Scorpions as a band were almost 20 years old. And while the first decade or so of their existence, the German outfit was working on conquering Europe, by the early 80s, and especially after the release of Blackout in 1982, the band's loyal fan base has spread all across the world. And here, right away, I have a little coming out to do. Even though I absolutely love Love at First Stink, I actually consider it to be the best studio album by Scorpions. For some weird reason, it is still Blackout with its slightly more raw production, which remains my personal favorite Scorpions record. <laughs> But either way, given all that, the follow-up to Blackout was destined to become the most important record of the band's career, for it was the one which would either make Scorpions a forever mid-sized band with several more or less popular songs, or would skyrocket these German boys to the stratosphere. And we all know which one it is. <laughs> By the time of the recording sessions for Love at First Sting, Klaus Meine, who nearly lost his voice several years before that and had to undergo two surgeries under a scare of him never being able to sing again, which by the way is a topic for another video concerning the Blackout album, but anyways. By 1983 he was fully back on his feet and sounding possibly better than he ever did before. Yet this time around, it by all means wasn't smooth for the band either, as there were several other health issues which affected Scorpions. Fight. Baby, fight. Just before the production was about to start, Hermann Rarebell and Francis Buchholz had both fallen ill, yet Scorpions, who were on a very tight schedule, since they have already taken a two-year-long break to release their ninth output, and which in the 80s was considered to be really a lot for a heavy metal band, decided to not postpone the album's production. And so Herman and Rudolf Schenker have invited their friends, the no less legendary Jimmy Bain and Bobby Rondinelli, who worked with Rainbow and many other incredible bands, to substitute for the two ill members. And thus the recording sessions for Love at First Sting have begun in Sweden. Klaus Meine remembers that the band has worked really hard on the album every day in the studio, and then tend to party even harder at night. At one point, he remembers that they went out to a local pub and then at midnight invited everyone to go back to the studio to do another take of Still Loving You, with gazillion people in the control room. And yet still, together with Jimmy and Bobby, Scorpions managed to record all of the songs for Love at First Sting. And actually even more, including some of the songs which never made it on the album and were only released by the band as demos 31 years later. <laughs> Yet after returning from a short two-week tour in the United States, the band's longtime producer Dieter Dirks, being a perfectionist he is, insisted that the Swedish recordings were not up to par with how he wanted the album to sound. And so instead of doing a couple of additional takes, the band decided to re-record the album in its entirety, with the band's actual lineup in Germany. And this is where they brought their sound on Love at First Sting to a perfection making it an album we all know today. Now, 
Roughly a month before the release of Love at First Sting, Scorpions dropped the first out of the four singles from that record. And this is where the hell got loose. Although, interestingly enough, Rocky Like a Hurricane could have sounded completely different from the version we all know today. Written by Rudolf Schenker, Rocky Like a Hurricane was originally an instrumental piece, and when Rudolf introduced it to the rest of the band, Klaus spontaneously shouted that this riff will rock you like a hurricane, giving the legendary song its title. Yet interestingly enough, most of the song's lyrics were actually written by the band's drummer Hermann Rarebell. When Rudolf first brought the song to the Scorpions camp, Hermit was still absent sick and in need of much rest, and so the song remained an instrumental until the drummer was back from his lead, sounding like this. Yet upon his return, Herman wrote most of the song's lyrics, which according to him are actually autobiographical, and are based on a very particular love adventure of his. Even more, apparently he wrote this song while his partner was sleeping, describing the scratches on his skin in the song's lyrics, to which Klaus Meine added a chorus later on. And by the way, it is a line from the chorus to Rock You Like a Hurricane, which has given this album its title. And right upon its release, Rock You Like a Hurricane has already ensured the album's success and especially in the United States, immediately reaching number 25 in the US Billboard Hot 100 and number 5 in the US Billboard Top Rock Tracks. In fact, the idea to release this single and target the US audience with it was possibly the single best one by the band's management, as this song has perfectly captured everything hard rock and heavy metal represented back in the 1980s. And in addition to that, its provocative sexual lyrics really triggered many of the Puritan groups in the United States, which of course only increased the song's popularity. By the way guys, just wanted to point out that only around 30% of the people who are watching my videos are actually subscribed to the Metal Pilgrim channel. And so if you still haven't done so yet, and especially if this is not the first video you're watching on this channel, I would really appreciate it if you would consider subscribing right now. Let's continue building this amazing heavy metal community together. We're gonna have a good time. Always. But of course, the lyrics of Rocky Like a Hurricane wasn't the only thing which pissed off some people. The original cover artwork for Love at First Sting was created by a German graphic design company Kochlowski and featured a photograph by a rather famous photographer, Helmut Newton. Now, this photograph depicts a couple hanging out on a beach with a bit of the lady's side boob showing, which in all honesty, most wouldn't even notice today. But still, just to be safe, the record company still showed the artwork to retailers in the United States and received absolutely no complaints about it. And so it wasn't until after the album was released that one major US retailer started getting complaints from customers. That retailer was Walmart, which at that time wasn't as huge as they are today. Yet still, in order to not annoy their customers, Polygram Records issued a risk-free version of Love at First Sting, simply placing a band's photo on the front cover, which the record label has actually taken from the inner sleeve. Of the original version. And here, as a person who grew up knowing only the provocative artwork, I actually have to point out that I, in all honesty, do not understand what is the problem with it. No, seriously, it is by far less provocative than most of the artworks released around that time, including the ones which Scorpions themselves have used for their previous albums. And Klaus Meine? actually agrees with me. We just did not know it would be a problem in America. It was just sex and rock and roll. It is odd that in America that some of these covers were a problem because in the 80s, when we would tour here, we always had boobs flashed to us at the front of the stage. Nowhere else in the world. Just here. Yeah. But as we all know, such restrictions as they usually do only increased the hype around the album and even more so around the tour. Scorpions were about to go to in support of it. In order to support Love at First Sting, Scorpions embarked on a massive three-year-long 
tour, playing a mind-blowing amount of 184 shows all across the globe. More than half of those concerts Scorpions played in the United States, and yet the pinnacle of that tour was of course the co-headline performance of the first ever Rock in Rio, where Scorpions played on two nights, performing their set right after nobody else but Ozzy Osbourne, in front of more than 300,000 people. <laughs> Luckily for all the fans, the first part of the Love at First Sting tour has been thoroughly documented by the band, and so in June of 1985, while the band was still traveling around the world with that same show, the fans were blessed with the Worldwide Life album, which featured the audio and the video footage from six different shows the band has played in 1984. <laughs> And yet, interestingly enough, despite an enormous success of Love at First Sting and the length of that tour, Scorpions did not actually perform every song from that record live back then. And so the song The Same Thrill was performed live only three times by the band on that tour, and the tracks As Soon As The Good Times Roll and Crossfire weren't played by the band at all. And despite the fact that since then, such tracks as Rocky Like a Hurricane, Coming Home or Big City Nights of course became the obligatory songs for the band to perform at almost every show, those three ignored tracks were actually never performed by Scorpions since then. This situation, which is of course about to change, since this year, to celebrate its 40th anniversary, the band is set to perform Love at First Sting at its entirety at the updated 2024 Love at First Sting tour, which they will also bring to Las Vegas for their yet another residency this year. <laughs> and the truth is that despite Blackout still, remaining my favorite Scorpions album, I would absolutely love to see the band performing those three songs, and especially the speed metal like The Same Thrill live this year. Although it does look like, of course, I'm about to miss this tour once again. And all because of one mad dictator's ambitions and his insane army of war. So here, by the way, guys, I just wanted to once again publicly thank Scorpions for being true to themselves and loudly and clearly voicing their support for my country, despite uh, the whole fact that before the big war started, Russia was actually one of the biggest markets for Scorpions. And yet Scorpions just once again proved that they are, in fact, one of those bands who are willing to go an extra mile and stand for what they actually believe in, despite rather substantial financial losses that such stand might bring to them. So once again, on behalf of all Ukrainian rock believers and metalheads, I just want to thank Scorpions and everyone who continues supporting us through this very and very difficult time. But nevertheless, it looks like now, 40 years after its release, the Scorpions fans will finally be blessed with a live rendition of some of the best songs they've ever read. As despite the whole fact that, of course, Rock You Like a Hurricane has pretty much become an anthem of the hard rock and heavy metal of the 1980s. I still actually believe that the same thrill is one of the best songs this band has ever written in their entire career. Love It First Sting is by all means a no regular heavy metal record, and its success and importance of course lies not only in the controversy around some of its lyrics and artwork or a well thought through songwriting. Love It First Sting was the record which was able to do something similar to Judas Priest's Screaming for Vengeance and Metallica's Black Album, by blurring the lines between heavy metal and, in case of this album, a romantic hard rock sound, suddenly interesting millions of people around the world who were as far from the genre as it was possible in our music, despite still remaining true to the spirit of rock and roll. Love at First Sting became so popular in some countries in Europe that, according to some sources, its closing track, Still Loving You, resulted in an actual baby boom in France, where close to 2 million copies were sold of this single alone, and around 1,000 babies were given a name Sly, which stood for Still Loving You in 1985. <laughs>
it was the album which has opened the doors into a new era of recording, becoming one of the first fully digitally recorded heavy metal albums, and also the doors into a new era of a much more commercial sound for Scorpions, but at the same time also had a reverse effect and became a gateway to rock and metal for more new fans than most other albums in the history of this genre. It was able to balance on a line between rock and metal that suited the 1980s landscape perfectly, and yet today, 40 years later, it is still as relevant as ever. Who knows, maybe without Love at First Sting's success among the wider mainstream audiences, rock and metal would never be able to go on for as long as it actually did. But what about you? What do you guys personally think about this record? And would you like me to talk more about Scorpions on this show in the future? Please let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching this video, guys, and we will prevail. Slava Ukraini!